So, uh, hello, welcome back. Uh, it's been a while, but welcome to episode number 25 of Kit Room, aka episode number Fernandinho. Um, yeah, a lot has happened. Things have opened up. I've been back to work, and I'm sure many of you have too. Um, but but today, uh, let's, I'm changing things up a little bit, and some of you may know who I'm speaking to. Um, he's, he's a good friend of, of Rob, who was on... Uh, previously uh, but I will throw it over to the guest so uh, Mr Guest who are you and what do you do in the world of, of media and sport and whatnot? Hello Ollie I am Dave Masterman and I produce a radio show on Five Live with two comedians called Ellis James and John Robbins. And uh, I know in, in the kit world Ellis James is, is a very big name uh, for his uh, I think he's got quite an extensive wealth collection I'm not too sure on that though. Well, the the two the two chaps who are good friends of mine and fantastic radio presenters um, and human beings often have a lot to say, but on the odd moments where, for whatever reason, on a Zoom or in a studio before we're about to go on the radio, if if conversation stalls or for whatever reason there is a silence or two, the go to conversation between me and Ellis will always be about a kit that we've seen in the past week or just kits in general because we just know we could fill five minutes on that, 10 minutes on that, and then get back to what we were probably meant to be talking about, which is probably to do with organising a radio show. Um, Ellis is a huge kit fan, and you're right, um, Wales in particular. He's got a lot of Swansea kits as well because he's a Swansea fan, but he's got some some real rarities that he keeps in... um, like plastic ziplocked bags, like yep. suction bags under his bed that he's, he's been known to say in the past, he will not pass those down generation to generation. When he dies, the kits go with him essentially. <laughs> Cause he's got some proper rarities from like the mid eighties and things, which he, um, which are his pride and joy. I don't, I don't think he's ever quite said that he prefers them over his two children, but it's we all know it's what he's thinking. It's yeah, it's one of them where it's kind of a given. Um, I I yeah. will I will uh, fight tooth and nail to get to get Ellis on, and, and hopefully he'll he'll whip out some of these shirts. But um, when you talk about uh, just talking about shirts, there's there's an Instagram account called um, Shirts of New York, uh, and it's it's run Ooh. by a guy called uh, James Campbell Taylor, and he, he's I can't remember where he, I think he's from London, but lives in New York, and if he's just walking around. If you see someone in a football shirt, he'll ask him, can I take a picture? And then just ask him why they're wearing the shirt, where they're from, and, and, and what's their connection to that team. It's a really interesting read in just some of the shirts you see just wandering around New York. It's like a, a whole city shirt from 2010. It's like, what are you doing here? Wow. Have you have you seen the Twitter account? I, I think it's just called Kit Crimes. Yeah. And it's a really great one because the minutiae that they go into in terms of like errors that are like if if a team's wearing their away kit when in theory they really should still be wearing their home kit because it doesn't quite clash with the team that they're playing the anger the frustration in this tweeter's voice i mean i am obsessed by it but i mean it's so detailed like i don't think they should be wearing those socks with that kit when clearly the other socks are that color so why have they changed just the socks on their home kit and for me that's that's like porn <laughs> just look at yeah, porn yeah, yeah just there's... watching just listening to these fanatics talk about the real small details of why west ham are in a different pair of socks than they should be it's it's amazing stuff there's another two accounts I'll shout out then. So there's also Away Kit Watch, which does the same. So they will just oh, sit and wait for the Away Kits. And there's also Football Kit Geek, who um, I highly recommend if you're not following. Lovely, lovely guy. Um, and he will uh, document every fixture um, and he will document what shirt, colour, shorts and socks they wear. And at the end of the season, he's got this massive Excel graph of wow. every colour, every kit combination. And he's like, oh, yeah, and... Um, so West Brom this week are playing in their fifth different uh, home kit variation for this season of different shirts, socks, and it's Love amazing. It. At the end of the season, I, just, I want that as a poster. Just it looks incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're a, I think we're a rare breed. There's a, there's a lot. Well, no, not a rare breed. There's a lot of us, but people that aren't because I'm on WhatsApp groups with mates, mm. you know, who are really into their football. You know, they have barely been. I, I wonder whether half of them are still furloughed. The amount they've been commenting on the Euros at two o'clock in the afternoon, and where I'm there trying to do a busy day's work, and there's twenty of my mates talking about the the Slovakia game that's just kicked off, and I'm like, there's no one working anymore. What the hell's going on? But it's amazing. You get into kit chat on some of those groups, and the amount of people that just go, "We're not doing kits again. We cannot. I do not give a. I'm not. I won't swear because I don't know the swearing on the podcast. But more than welcome to." I do not give a shit about football kids. And I find that bizarre that people who could be, who, who are so into footy um, 
just don't, some of them just don't care about the kit design of them and the art that goes into mm. kits and, and retro kits and the ones from the, the nostalgia of the 90s. I find it bizarre that people can be so passionate about the game, but it doesn't follow through into the sartorial side of things. Yeah, it's like when you go to games and the, you see people who kind of refuse to wear the club's colours. It's like they, they've got to wear their, their Stone Island or something. It's like, I, I mean, you just look like some random Joe. I normally, <laughs> I normally ask what, what you're wearing, uh, if it's anything football show related, but I know you have a shirt behind you. Um, so Dude. for those audio listeners or, or, or visual uh, watchers, um, what, what shirt is, is lurking behind you? So behind me is, is my favourite all-time Man City kit. Um, there was a period when I, where I was just getting into City and it must have been around, I say just getting in, it was a few seasons in, but I'll tell you what it was. We were terrible. <laughs> we had already been relegated from the Premier League and we were in this kit because I think Kappa, uh, I mean, they couldn't have foreseen this because I'm sure the deal was made halfway through the previous season. But Kappa, who made some fantastic kits for us, their first season with us was after we'd just been relegated in what must have been 95, I think. Um, so the first kits that they put us in was when we were in the old League One at the time. And the the kit that I just think has always been the best designed kit that we've ever had, and I can just picture Georgie Kincladzi in it now, and Kevin Horlock in a long sleeve version, um, is the maroon and navy blue white um away kit for City, 97, 98, I think. And it's behind me now. You can see it there. Yeah. It is just a thing of beauty. It's, it's for anyone that, that doesn't know which key I'm talking about. It's got the navy blue panel that goes across the shoulders and across the top of the chest um, with the white cap assigned there on, on that navy blue section. And there's a very thin white panel. And then there's almost like a thick maroon panel that goes across the middle. And then the rest's white. It's quite similar to a lot of West Ham away kits these days. But for whatever reason, City of... Ne- and by the way, you can speak to a lot of City fans. A lot of them say that this kit is one of their favourites. Like it's it's up there for, for a lot of City fans because it's just classy. And it's just of an era as well when we were terrible. And I think in a way, City fans always look back on those times quite fondly. I, I'm amongst those who say... Maybe barring Aguero 2012, some of my most precious City moments is from when we were rubbish. Gillingham 99, uh, I saw them play Tottenham in 2004 when we were 3 0 down at half time in the FA Cup. And we yeah. ended up winning 4 3 with 10 men after Joey Barton got sent off at half time. I mean, we weren't as bad then, but we still weren't oil rich at that point. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have that nostalgia and they look back at those kits in their formative years. And it's usually one of those kits that City fans are more obsessed with. And that away kit for me, if you wear it now, like we were talking about before we came on, the neck's a bit tight. The actual, the actual fit isn't great because kits back then were just generally quite boxy. Mm -hmm. But I'm so surprised if you look through and I've got, I've, I've been looking through recently, like the kits since that's been made, away kits for City, there has not been one recreation of that kit. And it blows my mind because we all think it's the best away kit City have ever had. So why has no one gone, you know what, boys, maybe let's not go for the pastel paisley just yet. Why don't we recreate a shirt that we know is so popular amongst the fans? I'm not too sure because because there's only been, so we only had like what, four Kappa kits in total. Um it was the yellow one, yeah. uh, which which I don't think was commercially available. I'm not sure. There was, You're absolutely then, right. And then there was the well, the, the laser blue home one, which was over the two years. Um, and, and laser blue didn't last long, did it? I think Reebok kicked that out after the Cox Sportif uh, had it at the yeah. start of the early yeah. noughties. And then and then we went back. But so so we've not seen the return of laser blue, um, which was a misstep. Let's agree. It well, had its time, and obviously with that initial Kappa kit, which was laser blue, mm. um, which was the home kit to the away kit that we're talking about, um, I suppose because of its time and place, you look back fondly on that kit. But I think if City if City decided to go decided to go back to laser blue now, I think there would be a bit a bit of a kickoff. I just think it's because yeah. fans just didn't care back then. We were in Division <laughs> Two; <laughs> they could wear whatever they wanted. We were absolutely rubbish. Um, but yeah, laser blue was a was a bold move for a few years, wasn't it? It did come out of nowhere. Um, yeah, and then the the away one won in the ninety nine playoff was remade by uh, Nike, or, or they did their take on it. Um, I think that was our last away kit with Nike, wasn't it? Uh, the oh uh, navy blue one with the very thin pinstripes. 
Oh yes, of course it was. You're right. Yeah, that was um yeah 2018, 2019, wasn't it? And yeah, yes, because it was it was the late it was the pinstripes that was the nod to the mm. to the 99 kit. But I mean that's an iconic kit as well. That fluorescent yellow and black striped kit from 99. I mean it would be hate it would be hated today if it didn't represent such an iconic moment in city's history. It would be forgotten. It would have just have been forgotten in the annals of time if. If it were, if in ninety nine in that kit we hadn't scored two goals in three minutes against Gillingham, which is essentially the turning point of all City's fortunes, yeah. if we hadn't, if Dickoff hadn't scored that second goal, you just never. I mean, it's it should have, would have, could have. But where would we be now? Would we have ever got out of Division Two? Because we only just scraped into the playoffs, if I recall, or we definitely hadn't had a great season. Mm. So to to wonder whether we would have actually scraped out of division two. You just don't know, do you? It's amazing what, what fate the, you know, dealt us that day. But I think after the, the, the super league was announced, I think Kevin Horlock tweeted saying he missed that. He wished he now wished he missed his chance that he had to know. It's like, yeah. Oh God, we're going, going to the aluminous side of kits. So we have oh, yeah. a few. Um, I, I managed to track this down. This is, so unbelievably rare to get your hold of, and it's because it was grim and no one bought it. Um, right, wow. But- so, the, the yellow and black Reebok Thomas Cook kit, which must have been mid noughties 2004, no, 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 yeah, 2005, 2005 six, probably. Yeah. yeah, Micka Richards goal against Aston Villa. Micka Richards goal where he swore in the commentary after the game. <laughs> the first thing the commentator said was, Micka, first goal for Man City, how does it feel? Oh, fucking hell, mate, it's just fantastic. <laughs> Like the first press he'd ever done in his life, not been media trained for a second, and literally the first words out of his mouth was 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 the f bomb. I mean, we should also say happy birthday, Mick Richards. But um, oh, is it? I, I believe so. Uh, oh, right. Right. He shares a birthday with uh, Messi, I think. But um, no, because the other the other uh, f bomb that was dropped was um, uh, Balotelli. I think it was after the ninety three twenty game. I think they asked him, right. like, oh, or was it after we won the FA Cup? I'm not too sure, but they asked him about, like, oh, Mario, how are you feeling? He goes. I feel fucking brilliant. Can I say fucking brilliant? <laughs> and he just said it twice. <laughs> like, no, Mario. No, you can't. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but just jump back. I, I'm currently wearing the training shirt from 1994-95 season. Um, I was wondering what it was. Um, I, I mean, it's it's a classic. It's it's sky blue with almost diagonal panels, a uh, big Umbro logo in the centre, and then just below it, big um, um big Man City old school badge from the mid-90s. I suppose that's the era when... You had like um, na- those navy blue drill tops as well with the big Umbro logos that came right down over the side of it and stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm actually watching one of them on eBay at the moment. Um, I bet. And I might I might postpone this episode coming out until it finishes because there's only one watcher at the moment and it's on for 20 quid. Uh, but then on, yeah. on the sleeves yeah. as well, uh, you've got Brother and Umbro on both sleeves. Oh, different times, Ollie. Different. It's- I mean, you just, you just don't, they don't make them like that anymore. Like you see, you see, Liam on, I think, the second night of Main Road, coming out in that baggy Umbro drill top. Mm-hmm. And then again, I say they don't make them like that. It's pretty much what the fashion is now, isn't it, again? It's back to that baggy kind of retro, um, tracky, tracky logo-led top. So I suppose it has come back round. But, oh, my, just such fond memories of that. Like they, they were, like, the, the era that you're talking about, for 94, 95, 96, was me just falling in love with City and just not... Want, just wanting it all like with David White and Gary Flickcroft and that era when and those kits that were around them were, were so uh, yeah just so iconic maybe, maybe only, only iconic for me because that's that's when I got into them but um, we've had some belters yeah I mean that would that would be a good segue onto, onto the next section um, which is um, your introduction to football so um, people who have grown up in in Football hubs, I know them as. So the Northwest, you've got several big teams. You've got London with with however many professional teams knocking about. Um, and then Midlands, there's there's a couple knocking about. But um, it's kind of impossible to grow up in the Northwest and not stumble into football or, or have a, a an interest or a, um, a family member who tries to push you into football. Um, so so what what was your introduction uh, to the sport? Um. I recall not having much of an interest when I was very small because a few of my other mates had started to get into it. I'm talking like when I was maybe six or seven or maybe even a bit earlier, five or six, seven. And I wasn't that bothered. Then my dad um, formed a football team called Mountfield Rovers, 
or formed that age group of the football team. The actual football team had existed for many years, but he decided, you know, he's got a son who might fancy it. it wasn't massive either way at that point, but he he had a he had a mate called Mike Cruz, who he had a son who was keen, same age as me, different different primary school. So we kind of got it up and running. And even then I was kind of dragged along a bit. And it's weird to look back now, given the years that followed and stuff, but I wasn't born this huge football fan. And my dad's a casual football fan at best. I wouldn't call him. And in fact, no, he won't, he, he won't be happy that I've said that because he's been an avid Darlington football club fan ever since he was young. So no, he is an avid football fan, but he was never a big player. I don't think so for him to kind of take it upon himself to start this football team was, was amazing. And this Mountfield team, this group of, players that I ended up playing with for 10, 12 years, um, even longer actually, um, formed the basis of my friendship groups, the passion for football. And I think two of my very good friends, one called Dan, one called Adam, they both were just huge City fans. And Dan, um, his family are very inner City. You know, they've got, they've got good connections. They've got a box under his granddad's uh, a chap called Tudor Thomas, who is an honorary president at City and very, very highly respected at City. And I think, I think I'm right in saying, put a bit of money in back in the day when we were really struggling just to keep us going and stuff. So that he's, he's thought of very fondly. So Dan, you know, I used to go to games with Dan, uh, you know, I was ball boy for City for two years not because I was on the academy like most ball boys are um, because Dan took me to the match every week. We, we, you know, we had, we went to his granddad's box under the stadium, all very, I mean, hugely privileged. And I, I always did appreciate it. I never took it for granted because I just realized how amazing this was, but that, that kind of means my introduction to city was probably different to a lot of others. Cause my instruction was almost as if I was some sort of executive at the age of eight <laughs> going to these games at main road and like having soup and, and baguettes before the game. And then going back, back going back under the ground into the box at halftime and having warm pork pies. And I'm aware how ridiculous it sounds. And when I grew up through the years, I, I then very politely said to Dan, I was like, thanks so much. You know, we've had an amazing time and I'm going to go and get a season ticket in the North stand because I think I need to do it properly. When I was at the age, I could do that. And Dan completely got it. He stayed with his family in, in the main stand. But me and my mates then went to into the season ticket world and travelled in on the 157 from Bramall and Woodford and got the Doner kebab beforehand. And then that's when I really started to just love everything to do with the routine of a match day. And then obviously that's getting towards the age when I was starting to drink as well. So then you're always going to Disbury and Fallowfield afterwards. So some of the days, like the long, long days we had without a care in the world, watching City when we were crap, um, were just some, of the, just some of my best times. So between Mountfield Rovers, which really got me into the playing side of it, I was a half-decent player. I, wasn't, I was never going to play for City, but I was all right. And then through just the social side and, the, and like I say, the routine of, I can still smell my dad's car. I, I can still smell my mate's dad's car who took us to City every Saturday for three years when we used to go with Dan. His dad was called Steve, and you can just still remember all that. Remembering hearing Mike and the Mechanics, and that was all the always the songs that we sang along to in the back of the car. And yeah, very very lucky to have been introduced to City in that way, I think. And then kind of moved into the 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 slightly more rough and ready world of City. And the North Stand, if people don't know, is was the was the Larry boisterous stand at City that you wanted to be in if you wanted to be in there with a bit of trouble. But in terms of the the songs were started there. The energy was there. The spikiness was in the north stand behind one of the goals. And yeah, I used to go with my mate Jamie and my mate Adam and we had some fantastic years at, at Main Road before it sadly got knocked down. Yeah, so so your introduction to football was you were part of the prawn sandwich brigade. No, um... I was, do you know what? And, I, and, and I, I could lie and I could say, my dad took me through the back streets of Moss Side and we got mugged and, all, and I just couldn't believe it when I went in. But no, I, I genuinely think for the first couple of years or for the first few years, um, it was my only real way in because my dad was a Darlow fan. He would have absolutely taken me to City if I'd asked him. But yeah. the, the the more sensible option was this family who we were very close with anyway, we're going every Saturday. They very kindly said, if Dave wants to come to the games, it's free of charge. And it was a very, yeah, like I say, a very a weirdly privileged position to be in, but it got me watching City and it got me into City. And yeah, I, the, the passion... Just because that was my introduction, it doesn't mean the passion wasn't there and I didn't appreciate what what was going on then. But 
yeah, I'd probably say the, the, the even more satisfying years was when, you know, you come of age and you can start to go on your own and that buzz of getting the bus and you've got, you've got your season ticket pass, which was a, a booklet, an actual booklet of tickets. Um, and the world was your oyster. And it was, it was an amazing feeling of freedom, just getting out, getting up and out and, you're on the 12 o'clock, 157. You know your mate's going to get on in five minutes' time. You know you're going to go for that doner kebab. You know you're then going to go to a couple of pubs. And then it's it's a fantastic day. Yeah, I, I sadly never got to go to Main Road. I was I was born in uh, 97. Um, and, and from what I remember uh, as a kid, uh, my dad was always more into rugby than football. Um, mm. He and my mum split. He's gone off now, Everton fan, with the, his, my, my step family. Um, and my mum remarried and he was a City fan. Uh, and he took me to my first uh, game around, I think it was around 2004. Uh, could have been later, maybe 2005. Um, and then got a season ticket from there. Um, so I, I, I was going quite young as well. But my uh, I wasn't really interested in, in football until around the age of, of, of seven, again, when I started playing for our local team. Um, nice. and, and now it's kind of just lost my season ticket. Um we won everything, which is an absolute nightmare to try and get another one back. Um, but I got my, oh, yeah. I got my first one back. Oh, I got one back again. Sorry, in uh, in 2015 um, when I moved to uni, which was really annoying because then it became a lot um, more expensive. Um, but I've still got it. Um, I've just renewed it as of uh, last week. So, so oh, hopefully, great. Hopefully next season um, will be a little bit better in terms of uh, getting fans in. I did get to go to the Everton game. I, I, me and my partner managed to get oh, on, on the ballot on that. Yeah, that was oh, well done. Uh, seeing, see, uh, oh, tearing up a bit, at Aguero. Um, but, but we'll get to Cun. We'll get to Cun. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So you've spoken a lot about on the radio about going to, to main road and um, to the extent I'm not going to mention your poem. Um, but, but um, so how, how long did you go? So did you go from what you were 18, 17, 18 um, swing by the pub, go to the game. Yeah. Pub afterwards. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember it was the last game. We lost one nil to Southampton last game at main road. Um in fact, no, earlier than that. So the last season at Main Road, and I'd, I'd maybe say this was the pinnacle of my passion for City because I've, and I'll explain why in a second, but it was the last ever derby at Main Road. And I have never felt so nervous for a football game. And I'm not really the kind of person that got nervous watching football. Why would you? You're not involved as much as it's your team. I, I used to get nervous when I played. Hmm. About things that happen, things that I could affect is what always, which has always made me nervous and will still make me nervous to this day, but never watching City really. But that one, I don't know what it was. I was probably second year college, so maybe 17 years old. So it's that prime age of football rivalry between your mates because you've kind of got nothing else to really grasp on so you've not got a full-time job yet to worry about you've not you're not bringing up a family so you, that's when you're really into footy if you are into footy that age kind of late teens I found you're really into footy um but I just remember the because it was the last one at main road there was it just felt like there was so much riding on it and we just didn't beat United back then we it did not happen um and me growing up as a City fan for the years before, I don't think I'd ever been to a game when we had beaten United. We'd been thrashed by them many times. We might have got a couple of lucky draws. Funnily enough, since that game, even before the money started to come in for City, we did start to get a couple of half-decent results against United. But in that year, which was, I think, maybe the beginning of 2003, um, yeah, last ever derby, and I was just a wreck. But we won, and it was just the most unbelievable thing. We weren't meant to win. We we weren't a good side back then. United, I think, which I think they went on to win the title anyway, if I'm not mistaken. But there was a cracking mistake from uh, Gary Neville on the byline, which um, note uh, Gota uh, picked his pocket and scored. I think Anelka got one. Maybe Gota got two actually. Um, by the way, my memory is patchy, so if any of this is wrong for your listeners, I'm very sorry. That's fine. For half remembering. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the, the, after that, just me and my mates, it, it was it was a proper city day because we just couldn't believe what happened. So we stumbled out, stumbled through Fallow Field, stumbled through Didsbury and just had a great night afterwards. But um, And there was, a, there was a pub called the Clock Tower, which we always used to go to a lot and often watch the away games because they always used to show all the games as well. And there's another one called the Orange Grove. So all these, all these bars and pubs that aren't there anymore. Then there's a really cool old one, I think, in Didsbury, just off the main street called the Nelson, which is where me and my mate always used to go again to watch the away games when we weren't actually going to the games. But yeah, I'd say 
in terms of the pinnacle of the passion of supporting a footy team, that last derby at Main Road was was pretty special and very sad to. I mean, it's a shame you didn't go. It was it was it was it was just your proper old school stadium. It was all higgledy piggledy. You know, there was some massive. You know, there was the massive kip axe, and there was the Umbro stand at one end, which was almost kind of half modern but quite old at the same time the main stand was just vast it just went back and back and then like I say the north stand was the raucous end so yeah it was the final game when we lost to Southampton was really sad which is again weird because it's just buildings isn't it it's just bricks and mortar and it's 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 something that shouldn't have such a huge impact but again just because of the again my formative years were were pretty much spent there every Saturday so I remember being really really sad I think and I don't it, it takes a lot for me to cry. And um, I remember welling up that day and just thinking about the memories and thinking about kind of what that place had meant to me and me um, forming those bonds with my mates and stuff that are still good friends today. Like I'm still best mates with Dan, who I used to go to the games with, and Adam and Jamie, still my best mate, he's been the best man at my wedding um, a few years ago. So all these friends who I've known since I was five, six, I'm sure I would still be close to them, but I'm definitely closer because we also had this secondary bond, which was City. Yeah. And um, I was going to mention, so how did you feel about the, the move to, to that now? Well, then, sorry, Eastlands, now the Etihad. Did, did, you, did you go when we first moved or did it, did it take you a while to, to get into it? Yeah, I had a season ticket. Um, I went to uni straight after Main Road, was demolished or when we left Main Road. So 2003, 2006, I was at uni. So I would definitely say they were the forgotten years for me because uni just, I kind of lost a lot of it. I lost a lot of interest in City then. I don't know whether it was just because there was so much passion there when it was Main Road and also the change in lifestyle. I was now in Sheffield, which isn't a million miles away, obviously, but I just suddenly felt like I didn't have that interest. I don't even know whether I renewed, actually. So maybe I didn't for the first season. Um, So, yeah, I would definitely say there's a bit of a black spot in my supporting of City, and it was uni because it just kind of distracted me too much. And I didn't want to be – I wanted to treat uni as a place that I lived. That was to be my home for three years, pretty much. I didn't want to be the kind of university student who was going home every weekend, yeah. That's, I wanted to make new mates. I wanted to make a new life there and do it properly. So I think by that nature, I did lose a bit of interest. I still went, still went a fair bit, but it was definitely a secondary interest for me. Because that was, the, I think, halfway through my university was when I went, was when I drove to Tottenham to watch City win 4-3, but losing 3-0 at half time with my mate Jamie. So there was clearly some passion still there. It's not, it's not that I just completely disassociated myself with City, but... I think that was the first time in my life where there was something more important or there was something more distracting for me than City was for 15 years prior or maybe 12 years prior. All of a sudden, yeah, there was something that I just wanted to spend more time trying to do and just figure out. And that was everything. That's um, That was the work side of it, but also the social side of it. You don't want to be saying to your new mates that you're, you're trying to build these relationships and bonds with who you're living with. And every weekend they're going, Oh, we're doing this, trying to do it. Oh no, I'm off back to Manchester this weekend because it's city again. It, I think it would have just created quite a stilted um, experience for me. Um, so I kind of lost a little bit of interest. Um, and lo and behold, the interest came back in 2008, funnily enough, when we had millions of pounds pumped into the, I'm only joking. Um, <laughs> I, I met uh, as soon all as- the time. Oh, I mean, that's what everyone thinks. No one can believe that you would ever support City before 2008. It just doesn't, apparently City doesn't exist. Um, no, when I came out of uni about 2006, I picked it straight back up again. And that's when I got back to season ticket. And that's when I got back in uh, to the City of Manchester Stadium, as it was called at the time. And again, yeah, I had a fantastic time. It, it, I don't think it will ever be the kind of hotbed of noise and and passion uh, that Main Road was. Main Road was just so close to the pitch. It was so all over the place. It's very hard to replicate that. The character of that stadium is very hard. To, in a, the character of any stadium is very hard to replicate with new builds. It just mm-hmm. can't be done. Um, you know, Arsenal Stadium is stunning. But even that, you'd say, doesn't have the, the character of the, you know, the old school West Ham stadiums, you know, the Upton Parks of this world, um, the, um, the Fulham state, you know, the, um, the Craven Cottages. And 
all these little grounds, I just think just have that close, hot passion and and noise and and atmosphere that you do miss. And I, and I'll be the first to admit, I think City have lost quite a bit of the atmosphere that was once there back in the day, but also it comes with success. I think a lot of City fans don't know what to do with themselves now. It's almost like we were the self-deprecating underdogs. We, we love to laugh at ourselves. We were the loudest when we were the, the worst. You know, as we went down to Division 2 and still selling out Main Road, the atmosphere was the best it had ever been. But we were rubbish. And then you suddenly get good. And I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know. what. Maybe it's a British mentality thing more than a City mentality thing. Maybe most fans would go through this. I don't know. But I just get the feeling that um, we don't quite have that feistiness that we, we once had because you just, you don't need to have it. You don't need to be trying to roar. You don't need to be roaring your team on to get an equaliser against Ipswich, you know, on a Wednesday night. So I, I don't know. It's, it's a different, there is, there is absolutely an expectation now that City will win every game. And when you have an expectation like that, it's so hard to then maintain that gritty Dunkirk spirit that you get from not being very good. And I'm even talking like mid table in the Premier League. I think, you know, you, you have teams there that probably have better, and I'll admit it, probably have better atmospheres at their grounds week in, week out than City do. You know, if you go to maybe a West Ham, a big game for West Ham, you, you could maybe imagine that, and Everton, you know, those sorts of, you know, Everton's still got a cracking ground actually they're still fighting for something new and they're still fighting for, you know, their first ever title and their first FA Cup win in however many years, you know, there's stuff, things are really at stake there. And I know things are at stake for City, you know, we want to keep winning and we want, you know, the Champions League still eludes us. So there's clearly stuff we still need to be trying to win, but I don't know, is it, it feels harder to be as up for it as it was when you were scrapping for relegation. Yeah, I get that. And I'm, I'm not really too sure where it comes from. And, and one thing that the club did, which I'm so happy that they did do, was that they covered the running track from the, the Commonwealth Games and yes. put the stand around it. Because that is, like, I know at West Ham, there is a bit of a disconnect from the fans to the pitch. And you oh, look, there is, yeah. But you look at Selhurst Park, and, and if you're on the bottom tier, if you're on the first row, you can fall onto the pitch. It is that yeah. close. Yeah, um, Selhurst Park's a cracking stadium. So, so there's there's a lot of difference. I I I came to uni. Well, I'm still in Birmingham, but I, I went to uni in Birmingham, uh, and I lived by Villa Park. So I went to Villa Park a couple of times. But the loudest ground I have ever been to is um, the Hawthorns, and it was it was a half empty stadium because um, yeah. it was it was the season they got relegated. City went. I think we won like three 0 Gundogan came on, scored, but because it's all closed in, it's all boxy it echoes and it all goes around. I know Spurs are invested X amount on, and they had some percussionists come in and help design the building yeah. to keep the sound in and whatever. But I don't think you can replicate that with a new stadium. It just bounces around and it sounded like someone was shouting down your ear and we had a whole tear to ourselves essentially because there was no one there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... I, I don't want to... I, I just feel very fortunate. I think what I'm trying to say is... Because I, I think... I, I don't want to come across like I sound like I, I don't appreciate where City are now Hmm. and some of the successes we've had I I never I I always appreciate it and I always make sure that I remember and this is amazing and teams would give anything to be where City are at the moment it's incredible what's happened to us and yes it's down to money but the whole of the whole world of football is down to money so I'm not going to get hung up on that but I do feel very fortunate that and I quite you know there is there is a there's an ounce of pride in me when I can say that you know I was season ticket holder in division two and I was I was there on the on the night. I went to Darlington with my dad to watch us draw against Darlington in something like the third round of the FA Cup. So it had to come back to City and then we just about scraped a win against Darlington. In fact, that was the game where, because I was ball boy then, um, it, got to, it got to full time and we must have scored. What was the, what was the outcome? Because I basically got to full time and it had gone to extra time. But for some reason, I thought we had won on away goals or something. <laughs> so, I, so I, at the end of the game, as your mentor was, ball boy, you could be um, the person responsible for running around, picking up all the corner flags and taking them down the tunnel. So the whistle went 
the ball boys all ran back because we did still have to go back to the tunnel just to regroup. And then we're going to go back out again in five minutes time. I legged it around, picked up two of my corner flags from the end of the ground. No. I couldn't hear him, but my dad was in the Darlow and going, Dave, what are you doing? Put the corner flags back. And I took him to the, the guy who ran the ball boys. And he's like, why have you got those of you? And I was like, well, we always bring him in at the end of the game. He's like, well, yeah, but it's not the end of the game yet. We're going to extra time. I was like, oh, fuck. I know. I go back. I had to go back and put the corner flags back in the end of the ground, getting cheers from the North Stand and the Darlow fans. Um, but yeah, it, those games. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I'm happy that I was around for those, and that whenever I get levelled at me, oh, City fan. Yeah, I bet you've been a New City fan since 2008, haven't you? Ever since they were good. I quite happily say no. Um, I had a season ticket every year from as we as we free fell through the divisions and then back up again. I was at pretty much every game. So, yeah, different times, but fun times. Uh, that story is uh, is reminding me. Of, remember, I can't remember the players, but it was um, it was an FA Cup game uh, and Everton. No, no, Everton. Sorry, Arsenal drew, and I think it was the second leg, and they had to play extra time. But two of the players, it was like two youth team players, or whatever. They didn't know, so they took the shirts off and gave it to some fans. <laughs> and I, I can't. Remember, it must have been Murtasaka at the time, where the captain went. It's like, go back and get your shirts. We've got another half to play. Yeah. <laughs> so go back to the fans and be like, yeah, can we can we get our shirts back? <laughs> Which, which I mean, for for it to be a ball boy, it's quite like a heartwarming and being like, oh, that's that's quite cute. But for two players to do it, um, yeah. Is... Well, that's not my best. That's not my best ball boy story. Can I regale you with my best ever ball boy story? Please do, please do. And, you, and I think you'll appreciate this one. And this is where I got it right. So I got it wrong there with the corner flags, but I got it right with this one. Um, it was the semi final of the playoffs, so we were playing Wigan, and. We were 1-0 up, I think, at home. So we were about to go through to the final to play Gillingham. And we all know what happened against Gillingham. We we won and that was our ascendancy back through the leagues. It was maybe the 82nd minute. And I was always ball boy that season anyway. I was always ball boy, um, almost level with the edge of the penalty area in front of the kip axe. So the ball rolls over to me and the... The rule is you throw it back to the player that it needs to go back to as quick as possible. That's the rule. You're a ball boy. That's what you're meant to do. Sure. Maybe hold on to it for a second longer. If it's the away team, then hand it back. But I knew that seconds were vital here and I knew we needed to win this game and I was going to do anything I could to make sure that we did. So the ball rolled over and the ball had to go back to the keeper. So I stepped over the, the barriers, which again, you're not really meant to do. Um, or if you are meant to do it, or if you if you do need to do it, you're meant to go straight back over again. I picked up the ball and walked onto the pitch at quite a pedestrian pace and handed the keeper the ball. At this point, the linesman's going nuts. He's going, what are you doing? Just throw the ball back. What are you doing? And the keeper's going crazy as well. And I hand the keeper the ball and then turn around and stroll back off. And as I stroll back off, that section of the Kipax gave me a standing ovation. <laughs> because I'd wasted maybe 30 precious seconds to get us to Wembley for the 99 playoff final. And I, I feel like I played my part. I did well, my bit, which felt good. Well, without a Dave Masterman, we wouldn't have a Paul Dickov goal. So so in Who a knows? way... It, Who this, knows? It's the domino effect. Um, yeah. But that's, that's... I mean, at least it wasn't... Um, remember when the, the Swansea ball boy did it and Hazard ended up kicking him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't do it. Yeah, I didn't do a Hazard. It could have been could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you touched on um, the, the height of, of the Champions League final, which yes, has eludes us, but it was still annoyingly. Um, but, but what are some of your other city memories? Were you, were you there at the ninety three twenty game? Um, were you? I wasn't, and I could have been, which again haunts my dreams. But I was, I was in Manchester because by this point, I was living in London. So again, I wasn't going to. I, so for the last, um, well, for ten years between about. Uh, 2008 uh, and 20, uh, 2019, 2018, 19, I lived in London. So I didn't have a season ticket, got to as many games as I could. Um, but the weekend before I was back up in Manchester and it was at a point when I, you know, I was pretty skint as well. I was kind of early days in radio. So to go back up to Manchester was quite a big thing because as you know, the Pendolino isn't cheap to get up from London to Manchester. So it's not a trip you can make very often without really 
denting your bank account. And I was up the weekend before for whatever reason. And I was with Dan, again, my mate who, who we've been close for years with, and he's the big city fan. And I remember as I was walking down the street back home at 1am or whatever, he shouted down the road, went cock. Cause he calls everyone cock. He's like, cock, do you want a ticket for next week? Then or not. And I was like, and by the, by the way, we, we were a shoe in to win that champion, that league. You know, it, it, it was never meant to be that close. QPR no. were terrible. We were on fire. It was, it, was, it was a formality. So I just, I said something like, I'll have a little think. And then the day or two later, I texted him when I was back in London, just knowing that I didn't have the money to get back again. And he was, he'd offered me a ticket. Um, I said, I'm going to have to give it a miss. I'm just going to watch it in London. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's possibly my biggest city regret because it, just seeing what it meant to the stadium as, as Aguero scored in 93-20, um, yeah, if we could go back in time, I would have snapped his hand off. But you just don't know that that's going to be the case. And yes, maybe, I, I mean, it, it was going to be our first title. So maybe I was a bit dismissive in the first place and I should have found the cash because it was going to be a big game either way and it was going to be a big day. So maybe I was a bit uh, blasé about the whole thing. But the way it went down, God, what I would have done to have been there because it was, yeah, it still gives me goosebumps. Watch, I, could, I, could, I could watch those highlights every day of the week and it would give me that pep in my step that I need to get through the day because, wow, what a way to win the league. It's one of them, every time Sky tweet that video, it's like, yeah, you, I've got to give that a retweet. Got to give that a retweet. I've got to make sure everyone, as many people as possible, will see this goal again. But I was... Well, what's nice, what's nice about it is no, no one can ever take that away from us. Mm. We won the league in what will be the most remarkable fashion. And I know that Arsenal won it in 89, was it? Was it Michael Thomas who won it with one of the last kicks of the game, I think? Um, yeah. But in terms of winning it in such dramatic circumstances, not only did we win the league, no one can ever level at us that we have not won the league in the most amazing way. We'll always have that. And that's such, a, that's such an amazing thing. You can win the league. We've won the league since. And we've won it in quite close, you know, the city Liverpool sprint to the finish line from a couple of seasons ago was extraordinary but nothing's going to top scoring with United thinking they'd won the title yeah. with seconds to go against 10 men with 2-1 down against a team that were due to be relegated and Aguero to, to step up with yeah with seconds to go and it was our first one in so many years in 40 years whatever it was and yeah it's I, you couldn't write that and I don't think any team will ever do it in that way again. So it's kind of ours, you know, we, we, other teams will win the league, but no, no team will win the league like that. And in those incredible circumstances. The best, the best stat about the Aguero goal was that was uh, Balotelli's only assist from that whole season. Was it? <laughs> well, Aguero said, which again, does show the nous of footballers probably more than we give them credit for. He is convinced that he said to Balotelli, I'm going to drop deep. You stay around the edge of the area. I'm going to collect the ball. As, as quick as I can, as soon as I can. You stay there. Let's do a one-two and let's get this done. So Aguero, I mean, he could, I mean, that could all be absolute nonsense now. Of course you can say that, but <laughs> I, I believe him because it is what he did and and it, and it paid off. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of plans fall by the wayside like that in football games, but that's the time when it worked. And um, yeah, what a way to end a season. Yeah, I was, I was 15 at the time and I can't remember if it was, it was either my little brother and sister's baptism or my little brother's communion the morning of. So I went to yeah. that and then, and then went home. Um, and I, uh, we didn't have Sky at the time. So I went upstairs, I got uh, my PS3 and I got my, my twins Xbox. And using the web browser on that, on the main telly, I put the City QPR game. I brought my telly from downstairs and I put the United yeah. game on. I'm watching them side by side. Um, Amazing. Aguero scoring that. I mean, I don't remember anything from that game. Uh, Aguero scoring that goal I, I, is blackout for like a minute. And then I, I remember just snapping back and I'm, I'm on like outside like on the main road. It's like, how yes. on earth have I got here? <laughs> yeah, I was outside the pub. I, I had to go and sit on the other side of the pub because as we went down to 2-1 and it was slowly starting to dawn on me that this wasn't going to happen. And we were all convinced it was going to happen before the game. There's a back part to a pub called The World's End in Finsbury Park in London which was also showing footy, but just in a bit more of a um, casual way. And I just went and sat at a table on my own because all my mates were in the other bit. They weren't even mates that were going to rub it in. There was one United fan there who's a very decent United fan. So it wasn't even like I was getting away from them because they were going to yeah. take the mick. But I was just, I could not believe it. And I, and I was sick and I didn't realise how much I cared 
until we were 2-1 down with minutes to go. And then you suddenly go, bloody hell, I, I really wanted this. And again, a bit blasé about the whole thing because you only really realise what you're, what you're getting when you lose it, don't you? And we so, we so nearly did. But um, yeah, ama- amazing day. I, um, I never had the shirt from that game. Um, but I finally bought one recently. Oh, yes. Um, and what makes it better is it's in long sleeve as well. Um, Always better in long sleeve, Ollie. Always I, better. I, I say thank you very much, Dom, uh, or Kit Kingdom, for, for selling me this. He's a United fan, and he has. He won't like me saying that. He, I think his partner's a City fan, so he's got quite a few City shirts. Yeah. Um, and, and my payday is next week, and I've got two on hold, which I'm going to get from him. I'm going to try and get an Aguero nice. name set to put on the back. Um, but... I always, I was never a fan of the gingham collar on that shirt. I get that. You know, it, the, it the is sticky a outy bit. Odd color. Very weird thing to do. Um, yeah, the kind of like the gingham sticky up collar at the back, mm. which is something. If you speak to Rob Warner, who you've had on, he's got a story about that collar, and I can't remember what it is. I'm sure it's something to do with the owners, so to do with the shake, and they. Um, they insisted upon it for a certain reason because something like the Sheikh's son said that he wanted a sticky, a, a collar that stuck up or something to cover his neck. And he was like, yep, yeah, that's what we'll do. So apparently that's that's why. I mean, who knows how much that's true. But uh, yeah, it's a half-decent shirt. That I mean, it goes down in history, doesn't it? But I wouldn't say it's one of our classics, but it will be now because of what it represents, I suppose. Well, exactly. And I think the new kit for this season is going to be a, a remake by Puma on that, but I've, I've seen and heard the rumours and they're not fantastic. <laughs> yes, I've, I think I have seen the kit and it doesn't, it's not blown me away, I will say. No, definitely not. Um, no. But you, you touch on, uh, you were living in London, early days on radio, so, so let's move into to your, your job. Um, for those of you who, for those of you, for those who are listening who aren't familiar with uh, who you are and what do you do, um, what, what is it that you do? So I'm a radio producer. Um, and I have been since, well, it's pretty much since I came out of uh, university. It was always towards the end of college. And as I started into uni doing media studies, the reason I was doing media studies is because I knew that there was something in the media that I was obsessed with. And I didn't know what it was at that point. It could have been TV. It could have been film. I didn't know. I just knew that that's the area that I wanted to move into. That's what fascinated me. And then my friend got work experience at a place called Key 103 back in the day. Um, it's not; it's now called Hits Radio, but um, back then it was called Key 103 uh, in Castle Key in Manchester. And I was just obsessed with what her what she was experiencing. It wasn't even mine. I, I she managed to get it on the two week placement when we had to have a placement at college, and I hadn't managed to. And I think I had tried to write to them, so I was I was jealous. I was absolutely gutted. But then it suddenly dawned on me: the reason I was so gutted is oh, radio is clearly what I want to do because. This girl's got this two-week placement at Q103 and what I would give to be her. And that's where it kind of started. I was like, right, it's, it's got to be radio. So I just, worked very, I just worked very hard at uni. I ran the radio station, um, got work experience at many, station, at many stations when I was at uni. So Dern FM in Barnsley. Then was very lucky to get three weeks with Zane Lowe on Radio 1, pretty much straight out of uni. Oh, wow. Um, and then a kind of ongoing placement at XFM Manchester and XFM was my dream station. I was an indie kid, you know, I was obsessed with guitar music. So to be at this station called XFM, um, which played exactly what I listened to was amazing. So I just were, and it's probably um, a process now that is looked upon a bit suspiciously and rightly so in that I, I worked for free for absolutely ages. And you do question, were they taking the mick a bit? And yeah, they were, but I was still living at home. So I could have thought to do it at that point because it was this gap after leaving uni when I was just back at home again. So I just showed willing to do anything and everything. And that was from presenting, which I wasn't brilliant at, but I did overnights for a couple of years. And then I kind of moved into station manager and then eventually moved to London, XFM London and started to produce. And this is when it really started to kick, kick in. And I started to kind of move through the gears a little bit. Um, I produced um, a drive time show with Dave Berry, who was a fantastic um, presenter on XFM and still a really, really good friend of mine. Uh, and we just had, we had a great time for two or three years. We did drive time together. Then we moved to breakfast. And then that was my kind of residency on XFM breakfast then, because I didn't move off for the next three or four shows. So Dave went to Capital. I was still on XFM breakfast. Um, and then Danny Wallace came in, who was fantastic. He did a couple of years, but then moved on. Then John Holmes came in. 
I then moved up to exec producer when John came in. He was another really, really decent presenter in a very different way, quite scripted, quite subversive, but really good. And then that's when XFM got, uh, well, didn't get bought out, that's the wrong phrase, because it was already within the company, but got rebranded as Radio X. And that's when they basically did a whole revamp of the lineup. And that's when Chris Moyles came in. And again, I managed to kind of cling on there as well. Chris wanted to bring in his own team, um, but I was really keen to at least show him what I was worth. So the boss at the time of XFM slash Radio X, Chris Bourne, uh, he was he was really good at having a chat with Chris Moyles and saying, look, there's this guy here. He's the breakfast show producer. Give him a shot rather than kicking him out to bring your whole team across. So Chris Moyles gave me a shot, did a couple of years with him. Um and then kind of felt like I needed to do something a bit different. You know, I've been at XFM slash Radio X for almost 10 years at that point. And there was this executive producer role that had come up over at Absolute Radio. So an Absolute's a huge station, you know, over 4 million listeners across the network, which is a big old commercial station. I think a lot of people don't appreciate or don't realize how big Absolute is, but it's one of the biggest um, commercial stations in the country by some way. And they know what they're doing and they're, they're, they're a really decent outfit. And the, the, the boss really impressed me with what their vision was and what my role would be. Uh, so then went there really. And that's kind of where my London tenure ended really. Um, because then a couple of years into that, Hannah, my wife and I had a child back in 2017 called Lila. And then it just, so it, it dawns on you pretty quickly. If you want to raise a family and you want to raise them comfortably with in, you know, in a safe area, because as much as I loved Finsbury Park, you don't really want to be raising too many kids there. Um, and you want a house that feels big enough that you're going to be able to live in and not get stressed out in. And if I wanted to do that, still living in London, I'd have had to go and live in <laughs> Grantham or something. I'd have had to go so far out of London to commute in just to justify working in London. It became ridiculous. It's just a real shame because I was having a great time at Absolute Radio. Um, but in and amongst all of this, I should have said back in the day at Radio X and XFM, I also produced a Saturday show with Ellis and John. Ellis and John are two unbelievable comedians and unbelievable presenters. They do a type of radio show that you just don't hear anywhere else. Yep. It's so authentic. It's so genuine. And um, they, it's, it's all on the table. There are no airs and graces with those two. There is no commercial jock style that everything's got to be rosy and everything's got to be happy. That's not their style what you get is heart on sleeve um, reality with those two and, the, and those two are best mates as well. So when I moved back to Manchester, by the way, if this is really boring, just edit some of it out because it's people might find this just the most bizarre story of someone's career. But anyway, we're in now we're in just, it's, it's, I just speed bits up. It's funny that like, cause you say that people find this boring. So I, I also, I did a media degree. I graduated in media and I was kind of in the same boat as you is like, I know I want to go into media. I just don't know what. Um, yeah. So, so I, I got my degree and, and I'm still kind of, don't know what I want to do, which is why I'm, I'm trying out this YouTube podcast stuff and, and, and yeah. I'm enjoying Smart that. Move. It's been Smart a couple, move. It's been a couple of years. Um, but no, I'm 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 interested. In Good. It, so. Well, we're nearly at the end. We're nearly at the end. If no, if <laughs> so no one then, else is, it's mine. It's my podcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can do what you want. Do what you want. Uh, so then I move back. I'm going to be really quick at this point. Um, I got a gig at this independent production company. Now, an independent production company is a weird world. It's not a radio station. You basically supply shows for different co- networks, mainly within the BBC. But you basically make programming for whoever needs programming. It's an amazing amazing world because it's just so different and so varied so the stars align massively bearing in mind ellis and john was one of the favorite shows i'd ever done over at xfm very like i said very special show and it was a really sad day when i left to go to absolute because i left ellis and john at x and the stars aligned because at the same point i got a call from john he said we're thinking of leaving five live have been in touch um so at that point i was going to audio always and at the back of my mind i thought well hold on if they're going to Five Live, that show will have to be put up for tenure and and production companies will have to bid on the show to produce the show. And that's exactly what happened. They went to Five Live. I went to Audio Always. The show got put up for tenure yeah. and we won the pitch. And so I was reunited in a, in a wonderful uh, full circle. And that's what I've been doing ever since. I'm head of content at Audio Always. Um, so the Ellis and John thing, curiously, is only a very small part of my week. 
most of the rest of my week is, has nothing to do with those two, which is a shame because I love them, but it's a what is one show a week and there's other wonderful producers who bring it together. Um, so as head of content, I just, I deal with, all, I, I'm kind of head of all the other shows that we produce and there's shows on radio one, radio two, six music, five live Asian network. So I'm kind of responsible for all those, but the on air side, the one show that I still produce as an on air producer is Ellis and John. So it's my little treat at the end of the week to kind of still do the bit of, actual in-studio producing that I love with two people who um, I'm very fond of. Yeah, and, and if no one's listened to the to the, the, the radio show or the, or the podcast, which I listen to because I, I don't have the, the time to listen to the radio show, it, it, it is a great show. As you say, it's, it's nothing like anything else, um, like the chemistry between them two and, and well, you three actually, because you do, you do chip in and it, it's really, really, it's amazing. <laughs> Oh, um, thank you. And, no, I appreciate then, that. It's 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 down to them that they created it, and it's it is special. I think it's it's yeah, it's a very unique listen, and they're very funny lads. But um, you won't get many of the radio shows talking about the the nervous breakdown you had on a Zoom call, so you had to go and cry in the toilet for five minutes. Um, not me, John Robbins. <laughs> um, but he's but it's that honesty that I think listeners invest in, and. I think it's so important. There's, there's a lot of radio presenters out there and I wouldn't name any names or any stations, but they don't give any of themselves. Yeah. They'll, they'll just go on and, and play the hits and be chirpy and be bright and breezy. And you kind of feel like you're getting to know them, but you're not really because it's all a front and it's all a bit too polished and it's all a bit too smiley. I don't know how many people really want that. You know, there's, you want to know who you're listening to and you want to hear their stories and you want to know what, makes them tick but also what maybe they're struggling with or what maybe does make them anxious and I think it's it's that nuance in radio and and the light and shade of the presenters that you're listening to surely that's what most people want to listen to I find it bizarre if people just want to hear a kind yeah a kind of one-dimensional version of of a person when yeah, there's nothing to cling on to there. And I think with Ellis and John, there's there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot yeah. to cling on to. And then, but Ellis is the Welsh football fanatic. John's slightly more neurotic, but also a lovely, lovely guy, but into Queen and overthinks everything. Ellis underthinks everything. And that balance, that juxtaposition between the two is, I think, I, th- I think works well. And the amount of times you've been sacked is is immeasurable. But no, oh, they sack me a lot. Whenever I leave <laughs> the microphone up or if I play the wrong piece of audio, John sacks me, probably on a bi-weekly basis, I think. <laughs> But no, it, it, it is like you mentioned that. So I've, I've like, I, I don't listen to much radio, but if I've ever been sat in the back of an Uber or a taxi or, or I've, I've stumbled or I've been in work and someone's put the radio on while we're polishing cutlery or whatever. And it's always like you say, it's always chirpy. It's, you, they, they're not real people. They're putting on a front. It's like, you're not getting to know the person. They're always talking about some new emojis that are coming out. It's like, no one, <laughs> no one cares. I don't care. Well, the thing is, the, the thing is, Ollie, maybe people do care. I'm old. I'm 36 years old. Maybe... It's a generational thing. And actually, if you are an 18 year old or, you know, there's a whole drive to try and get young people listening to radio because it, by the sounds of it, no one really is, or not many are. We need more, you know, 18, 24 year olds listening to radio. Um, maybe that is what they want to hear about the next emoji. So maybe I'm, I could be the one that's out of touch. Maybe it's just me that wants to hear meandering anecdotal conversations about boilers and washing machines and whatever else. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go full Seymour Skinner and say, I might have a touch. No, it's the kids that are wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, I mean, that is all my questions. I, I was going to, the final bit was going to be talk through some kits. Um, but I think we've kind of done that already. And then the, the last one I've got is, is, that isn't in the background, is, is just this, the Cock Sportif 2007-8 shirt. Pinstripe. It was a nice kit, that. Um, who, Elano. El- Elano, is, yes. Is that kit. Yeah. There's always a player that I associate with each kit. Um, but no, I mean, at school, all I did was design. I just, my, my doodling was designing football kits. Yeah. And even now, like it's, it's a very weird, it's, it is a weird obsession because the fit of a kit, like if I could, the reason I want to, the reason I want City to bring back that 97 Capra away kit, the maroon, navy, blue and white one is I want to have it, but in the more contemporary fit and style that kits are now made in because in the mid nineties, as much as there were some amazing designs, the actual fit of kits was horrendous. Like the one you've got in the background there. I remember having that, the maroon and white diagonal striped yeah. one. That is a very boxy kit. Like there is no cut to that at all. There is no silhouette to that kit. It is just a box with arms. And you can tell and... it sits on the hanger as well. It is literally just... Yeah, exactly. So there was no thought that went into like how it would actually 
see, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the massively skin tight kits anymore. Mm. I never really was because I'm aware as football fans, we, we, we aren't all um, Jack Grealish. So we're not all going to have that physique that's going to work. But at the same time, you can, I think kits have almost relaxed a bit now, especially city kits. They're not as tight as they were, but at the same time, they're not, they've not gone right back to the baggy phase. So a casual fan can wear like the, the, the Puma kit this season, the, um, the home one, which whether you like it or not is a different matter, but either, you know, everyone says it looks like the bottom of a swimming pool. Um, but at least it's, it's a good fit because it just, it, it, it fits. <laughs> it sounds like a really stupid thing to say. So I hope that, I hope the point we're at now is the point we're at for years to come that kits just work and they just, they, yeah, they, they look good on no matter who you wear it. As long as you buy the right size, you've not got this kind of this box to it where it kind of just comes up below your belt and it's, it's, it's as baggy as you like and the arms flap around, which was clearly the style back in the mid nineties. But yeah, so the, the, the way they're made is, is almost just as much, if not more important for me as what is actually on the kits. Yeah, and the other reason I bought, pulled out this city shirt is because the, the the print I got on the back is because who doesn't love Stephen Island? Stephen Island, what a character! The um, <laughs> what a uh, character! I believe Bruno Fernandez had a poster of Stephen Island on his wall as a kid. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, Bruno, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> it, it it was it, it was in the Athletic because they live in the same part of Manchester. So they, and wow. I think they live on the same road, and um, I think the story was that uh, so Bruno Fernandez was a bit of a football manager kid when he was younger and apparently yeah. he'd always signed Stephen Island and had a poster of Stephen Island in a city kit I love on his wall that. Oh, as a kid. I do hope that's true I do hope that's true uh, I, oh, I'm, wow. I'm 90% sure it is um, yeah but uh, yeah uh, that is all my questions the last thing I do get to do though at the end of each episode is because um, this was mainly formed or filmed for our lockdown I started this series because I was ran over and couldn't do anything for two months uh, oh my god what happened <laughs> I was walking home. Well, from work. I mean, you've told me what's happened, but how how bad was it? Not bad. So I, I was walking home from work. It was uh, it was at two a.m. Um, on on Saturday, Ooh. the thirteenth of September, um, and I, I look up, nothing coming. Halfway across the road, there's two racers coming down, um, and I kind of uh... just freeze in the middle of the road. They go out and then realise there's not enough room, so they come back in, and I try and sprint out of the way. And as my foot <sighs> is up behind me, he's gone over my back foot. My shoes. Did they just? Did they just behind. drive off? Hit and run. Um, oh my god, mate! No CCTV, no witnesses, so it wasn't like it even happened. Um, so, so what, did you break your ankle? Or? No sprain. Um, I was in a boot for two months, and then when I was able to go back to work, there was another lockdown. So, this, oh man, <laughs> this is why this 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 podcast started because I had lots and lots of free time, and I love talking about kids of football to, to new people. However, that's not important. Um, well, no, what I would say is good luck to you because I think what you're doing. You're being proactive and like you said before, you want to get into media or you want to get into the, whatever world it is you want to get into, but you're doing something about it. And that's the most, that's all, that's, you know, it's not all you can do, but it's, it's an amazing thing to be doing. And a lot of people won't be doing that. So for you to, cause you'll be gaining your skills now, you'll be honing your craft, editing, you know, one of the, one of the most important things for me as a radio producer back in the day was editing. You know, if you could edit, you, you were going to get somewhere, you know, and you'll do, you know, you've got the visual side of it now as well. So yeah, yeah. Good luck. I, I think it's, um, yeah, what you're doing and, and creating something is the best way to then try and get into the industry that you want to get into. Oh, thank you very much. Um, but, but the last thing I get to do is because one of the industries that has been hit the most in the last year and a half is the arts industry, uh, not being able to do any concerts or whatever. So I, I, each, each episode, I get the guests to recommend a song, artist or album uh, for, for anyone to, to go check out um now now you being a, a radio producer uh is is a whole other kettle of fish so i don't know whether you need to go maybe a little hipster or, or what but we've had a wide range of, of, of uh, bands i think the um so i interviewed the vancouver white kit 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 vancouver white caps kit man uh <laughs> yeah, easy for you to say he, he, he recommended um, Smashing Pumpkins. I interviewed, uh, there's, a, there's a kit account on Twitter called The Shirt Union. They, they recommended Westlife. So there is, oh, wow. there, is, there, is there is no spectrum. Was it Westlife? I think it was. Uh, there, there's, no, there's a wide spectrum. You can go for anything. Well, I want to go a bit niche, not because I'm trying to make a point or be cool, but I kind of feel like if you're asking me that, I don't want to, I don't want to recommend a band that everyone already knows because... <laughs> not Wonderwall. <laughs> I'm not going to go Oasis. I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you, Ollie. I don't think I've put on an Oasis album in a good 10 years. There is almost like this preconception that I'm the biggest Oasis fan in the world on the radio show. 
I was a huge fan, but it's very rare that they bother the record player these days. Because when, when do you, re- at what point do you really go home and open a bottle of red after a long week and whack on be here now? Who's doing that? that that's very true. <laughs> I'm sure people are doing that, but <laughs> there are. I think I've just maybe grown out of them a little bit. I think is the point that I'm trying to make. That's fair. There are occasional walks to work where I'm halfway through there and I'm like, I could really do with listening to roll with it right now, and I'll just put that on, nothing else, and then yeah. I'll just go back to back to podcasts or back to whatever I'm listening to. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, who am I going to go with? Oh my god! There's, there's, see, there's a lot of music out there, Ollie. That's the thing. That that, that is the issue. Um, while you're it thinking, is. I'm going to recommend two um, because. Uh, well, actually, can I recommend two? Oh, you can recommend as many as you want. Um, oh, great. I'm, well, I, I won't do that. It kind of kind of ruins the point of it. But I might I might throw true. in two. Very true. Okay, Curveball three. Um, so I've I've just watched the latest uh, today. I watched the latest Bo Burnham special Inside. All the songs on that are incredible. The whole thing. If you've not seen it, I recommend. It. It's amazing. W- women on Instagram. So funny. It's very funny. It's, <laughs> so it's a, funny. he's he's a fan. I, I I like Bo Burnham. He's fantastic. Um, Half Moon Run have released a new EP in the last week uh, called Ooh. Inwards and Outwards. Uh, sorry, Inwards and Onwards. Uh, and the song It's True, very, very similar to like early days uh, Radiohead. Um, really, really great. And then finally, uh, DD Dumbo, who is an Australian artist who my, my friend, uh, who is the photographer for Melbourne City, uh, he, he got me into them. I met him through oh, very the nice. series. Um, however, the song Satan on, on, uh, by them. Very good. They're my three. Okay. I've got mine. Now, Ollie, if you're going to do three, I'm going to do three. Do three. I was only going to do one. If you'd done one, I'd have done one, but you've done three. <laughs> so you, we're now in for three, unfortunately. So it's your, it's your fault. But, uh, that's fine. Um, this is an electro duo who, and don't let that put you off, because I actually think that description is a bit unfair because it's very chilled out. Mm-hmm. And it's not usually the type of stuff I'm massively into, but... They're called Maribou State, okay. which is spelled M-A-R-I-B-O-U and then State. And their last album was called Kingdoms of Colour. And it's just the most beautiful, amazing album that you can just listen to at any point when you're getting ready to go out or in the morning or whatever, or whilst you're working. It's just a really chilled out album with, with kind of a lot of different sounds because I think they recorded a lot of the sounds from that album or for the album whilst they were touring the previous album. So it's very worldly if that's not too pretentious a, a way to describe them. But they're two English lads that, you know, they have guitars on the stage as well. When you go and see them live, I saw them at Albert Hall in Manchester and it was one of the best gigs I saw that year. And, you know, it's got all the the traditional sounds of a, a rock band at times. You know, there is drums and there is that guitar, but it's just, they're just a fantastic band. So listen to Maribou State. The album's called Kingdoms of Colour. The track I would choose on that is one called Glass Houses, which is stunning. Um, just an album for any mood and for any occasion. Um, one, uh, a bit more emo I like my emo. One of the bands that I was obsessed with back in the day was Jimmy Eat World. And I will still listen to Jimmy Eat World, but this is almost a grown-up version of Jimmy Eat World. They're a band called Manchester Orchestra. They're, they're not from Manchester. They are from America. Um, and again, they've got loads of albums. I'm not going to pick an album or a track. I just say, go and have a listen. They're incredible. They're this big, full... You, if you call them a rock band, I think you almost start to think of kind of Queens of the Stone Age or Foo Fighters, and they're not quite in that world. But you call them an emo band, and they're not emo either. They're in the middle. They're they're okay. an indie rock indie rock, I suppose, but real quality. And this this the, the, the singer songwriter Andy Hull is a fantastic songwriter. And some of those albums, I mean, if you were to go for an album, go for one called Mean Everything to Nothing. It's it's an amazing piece of work, and they've they've got five or six albums you could spend a lot of time getting into a band called Manchester Orchestra and I think they're brilliant and then the other one I'll go for is a singer-songwriter called Trevor Sensor who I know John Robbins is a huge fan of Uh, he's had two albums now he's not big at all I don't think Um, especially not over here but he's a fan of the show he was a fan of Ellis and John back in the day and he got in touch so me and John got into him Um, and he's got two albums out one called Andy Warhol's Dream and then one that he released literally last week called uh, On Account of Exile, Volume 1. Really raspy, drawly voice, really unique sounding voice, actually. And again, just a bit of a troubadour, singer-songwriter, uh, but the melodies that he has and just his songwriting style, he deserves to be a lot bigger than he is. 
Um, but I also kind of like that he's not that big because it feels like he's 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 my secret. Um, but yeah, Marabou State, Manchester Orchestra, Trevor Sensor, three very different types of music, but um, all fantastic. Fair enough. I, I've made a note of all three of them. Um, Good. Go on, listen. Let me know what you think. <laughs> I will. I don't know why I've made a note because I'm going to be editing this and now I'll That's hear true. it again. But, <laughs> yeah. but I've made a note anyway. Um, but, yeah, but just, do, seriously, because I always wonder because... I'm biased with my music taste because it all comes from a different place of nostalgia or whatever it is. The reason I'm into Manchester Orchestra is because of Jimmy Eat World and the reason I'm into Trevor Center is because he was a fan of the show. So it all kind of comes from personal standpoints, but I suppose that's the subjective beauty of music, isn't it? So it'll be interesting to know what you, th- what you think of them. Yeah. So, so the, the um, Melbourne city kit, the, sorry, the, kid, the the photographer who who um I've, I've done a few episodes with him on his channel. I, he's been on here, um, and we stayed in touch throughout lockdown. And I, I'd consider him a friend, but we we recommended each other uh, songs, uh, music. So I recommended him Doves because I don't know if, if Doves are going to be big down in there. Uh, and he's got me into quite a few. So I'd never really listened to Tame Impala much, but he's got me. Into oh them. yes, fantastic! Got me into them a lot. Uh, a, a guy called Slow Coaching, uh, who these are all Australian artists. Uh, Slow Coaching, Boo Seeker. And um, Lime Cordial. All. Oh, well, I've not heard any of them apart from the first one that you said. The, the, oh. Interestingly, though, Australian, the fourth one that I was going to mention, but as you're now into Australia, the fourth <laughs> one that I was going to mention is, is another band rock again um, called Gang of Youths, okay. who are from Australia and are brilliant. I think they've been recommended to me before, but I forgot the name. Um, yeah, they're so- great. So I will, I will listen to them. Final point, though, uh, Albert Hall in Manchester. What a venue. What a venue. Yeah, it got it was closed down for years. Uh, I don't know what it did. I, I think it was derelict for quite a while, which is unbelievable, bearing in mind how beautiful it is. Mm. And then he reopened it. Um, and that's where I saw Marabou State. But yeah, and I also went to Bongo's Bingo there as well. So, you know, it's it's a mixed bag. Um, that was my first venue I went to for a concert. I saw Half Moon Run there uh, in... Oh, I don't know when the first album was out, but but yeah, what a venue. Yes, nice. Well, Ollie, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. No, I've, I've enjoyed to... talking about City and Kits. Of course, I've, I've completely just got lost into it. I should probably do the outro. Everyone's just watching, like, look, what's going on? Right. Okay, <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> Everyone, thank you very much for watching, listening, whatever you're doing on whatever platform. Uh, if it's YouTube, please like leave a comment if you want to uh, and maybe subscribe if, if I've uh, entertained you enough. Um, and if you're on any audio platforms and please just subscribe and each episode will fall into your uh, news newsfeed into your timeline uh, whenever each episode drops uh, because now I'm back to work. I don't know how often they'll be, but I am planning another one. And it's going to be quite fun. Uh, but once again, Dave, thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's been a real, it's been a real joy. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I will see you whenever. (laughs) Bye-bye.